Okay, uh, this time uh, we're uh, opening the uh, May meeting of the Left 2 board. Uh, uh, at, this point, at this point, let's take a moment of silence for the firefighters and police officers and public safety people that have passed in the last month. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, a quorum, and I've hope the first uh, uh, first uh, um, business we're going to do is approval. How about approval of the minutes? So moved. I'll second. of a bill passing next session those are fair questions to ask if if that's part of uh, an important part of what you're um, considering and then also if there's any questions about whether or not this particular topic is within the board's um, realm of responsibility 
Um, those are those are the kind of things we'll be touching on today, and those are all fair areas for questions as well. With that, I can turn it over to um, Jacob. Everything's good to go. Let me. Uh... Jacob, before you get going, uh, just for all the uh, all the members that are on uh, uh, the the phone and Zoom and uh, the other things, this is more of a briefing uh, for the board. Uh, and questions are great. I don't believe uh, motions will be uh, taken today because we want to make sure that everybody has time to disseminate the information they hear today. Talk with uh, if you need to talk with Steve Moore and Jacob during the month so we can come out at the June meeting and have Jason and Dennis back in in the room with us. And at that point, we can uh, uh, prioritize what we believe as we see with the, the long list that we have, uh, hopefully prioritize three of the top uh, items that we'd like to see go forward. If it's more than that, that's fine. But I think uh, at this time, uh, we'll hold off on motions until next month. If that works with everybody. so. Uh, let me know if it doesn't, and if uh, with that, we'll move on with uh, uh, Jacob and his presentation. Jake. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the record, Jacob White, staff to the board. Um, yeah, I'll try to keep this relatively short. I could go, there's a lot of topics, and I hope I don't uh, get too in the weeds on any of them. Um, so starting off, uh, actuarial topics uh, for this interim. Uh, Steve and I did have a chance to meet with the actuaries. I think it was uh, just a couple weeks ago to go over each of these items and kind of the potential schedule uh, involved with them. Um, the first one is the long-term economic assumptions and report on financial conditions. Uh, that one, uh, the actuaries will have ready by September. Um, it could potentially be earlier if, if necessary, but uh, definitely by September. Um, and then there would uh, potentially be board action in um, November that and then uh, item number two would be the off cycle actuarial valuation report results there's no board action required on that item um, and uh, actuary's office should be more open on when they can uh, when the board wants that and when uh, they'll be able to do it and then the last item uh, is uh, something I don't think that's occurred since I've been here uh, which is OSA request legislation uh, and they sent a, Matt sent a letter to the board and I believe to the select committee um, about wanting to update uh, current statutes to reflect the current practices of the actuary's office where those are a little out of date. Um, and so for that, um, Matt uh, would be willing to come and speak to the board on that uh, whenever the board would like. As the state actuary, Matt actually can't do request legislation like the board can or the select committee can. So since his office supports all the plans, he wants to explain what it is he's hoping to accomplish with the idea that either the board or the select committee or both would endorse a bill for next session. So that's all for those topics. Going to move on to administrative. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about each of the 12 items here. Um, did just want to draw your attention to, I think the last two on there are the ones that are um, a little out of the ordinary from the typical administrative topics. And these ones were identified last year by the board during strategic planning. And those are board staff succession planning and recruitment retention salary setting structure for board staff. Typically, the board um, has an off-site um, or a, a strategic planning meeting, even if it's on site um, in October. And so the idea would be we would follow up on the board's request from last year by including that in the strategic planning discussion for October. But if there was, if that idea was not satisfactory, then June, and you wanted it, you know, start sooner. Um, that June would be the time to kind of let us know on that. Move on from administrative topics. 
to the bulk of this presentation, the benefit topics. So we've got 13 items listed here. Um, not going to discuss each individually right now. A, I've got um, additional slides in the presentation to, to identify each of these items. Although I did want to have a little space there. I could have crammed one more item onto there, and that would be um, one me and Steve have been discussing this week that was discussed last year, which was uh, there was a presentation regarding colas and inflation. And so I gave a presentation to the board last year, just an educational briefing on inflation. And so um, the board uh, didn't take any action to have that, um, to have any further discussion, um, but we have continued to receive questions from members um, on that topic. So I did want to at least mention that in case there was um, still interest from the board for, um, for that topic uh, this interim. So overpayment responsibility. So this one um, came out of uh, board discussions on a second survivor option window. When uh, the employer has made an error, the member's benefit is being changed and the board was looking at whether they should have the ability to change their survivor option. And that morphed into the board being more concerned or believing that the, um, the underlying issue wasn't the survivor option, but it was the member being responsible for uh, the overpayment when it was no fault of their own. And, um, and there's some areas of current law where the employer is liable, but in most situations it is on the member. And so um, yeah, the board wanted to um, look at that uh, this interim. Uh, benchmarking peer comparison. This was another one uh, that the board identified last interim uh, to move to this interim. And uh, this was kind of, my memory of this was, it was born out of the um, uh, benefit improvement passing and wanting and being interested in now where does left to stand compared to other states plans. Um, and then also just that it's been a while, you can see here that it was 2017 uh, when the board last had a presentation like this. And just uh, with changes in other states, uh, the improvement uh, of left two, uh, where does uh, the plan stand now? And so as far as workload, um, I, I wasn't here in 2016, so I can't speak uh, uh, too well on, on how much work that was. Uh, but uh, I would hope that since that work has been done in the past, that just going back and updating that, it's still going to be a, a decent amount of work to, to go and look at 160 other pension plans and update the materials on those. Um, but, but hopefully it would help uh, that it's been done in the past. And then we had the benefit improvement tiered multiplier. So for the benefit improvement that was passed uh, last year, um, there was a request the board received. I've got the letter in the up, up there on the materials um, from Seattle Firefighters and the Seattle Police Officers Guild um, requesting that the date be moved back one month. And the date is the, the line of when um, uh, members have a choice between a lump sum and tiered multiplier. So those that retired after February 1st, 2021 have the choice. Those that were before um, can only receive the lump sum. And so they asked that um, that move, be moved back a month and that the board study that. Then we had taxation of catastrophic disability benefits. And so this was a change uh, that DRS made. Um, they became aware of this while implementing a project for PCERS. PCERS now has duty disability. And in working with tax council on that, realized that an error had been made in how um, taxes were being done for uh, some left to benefits, uh, benefits for uh, catastrophic disability retirees. Um, it's not all of the catastrophic retiree benefits, it's just a small portion of those. Um, and so the board was uh, uh, interested, uh, when this was presented to the board last interim, the board was interested in whether um, the catastrophic benefit determination could be changed um, so that they were, uh, so they remained um, not taxable. Um, 
And then another one that was brought to the board, this was a request from uh, FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police, uh, for um, considering a drop plan, uh, which is a deferred retirement option plan. Um, this is one that um, I know the board hears about on a relatively frequent basis. The board last studied it in 2006. Um, Uh, should I explain what a drop plan is or? At its most basic, a drop plan is a way for um, employees to retire, but they remain working. So they stop earning pension credit. They um, Their pension payments go into an account, which is kind of held in trust for them until they finally do stop working. But um, and then when they retire at a later date, they kind of get that account with all of the back pension payments and earnings in it as a lump sum. It's there are dozens of variations on that general concept of a drop, but that is high level what it what it is. It. Um, um, can affect retirement behavior. So for instance, you might see people retiring earlier than otherwise projected. And so it can have a significant cost to the pension plan as a result of that. There've been drop plans around the country where that um, cost was not accounted for ahead of time or properly prepared for ahead of time and created some issues. Um, the, uh, as Jacob mentioned, the last time the board looked at this was, you know, 15 years ago. And so what the what would be the current cost? You know, it, that might be the starting point of any discussion about a drop is getting an idea of what type of proposal are you talking about and what would be the cost of something like that. Um, and Jacob, uh, real quick, have we done any background research on this? So 2006, you weren't here, I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> not, not recently. I mean, it's something that gets discussed and we, we do hear about it, just uh, what's going on with other cities and states that have it. And then, um, and I know in the past when the board did study in 2006 that they did um, get um, outside tax council advice on it too, because there are um, federal regulations. It's huge. And uh, most of the time there's a percentage you know, put on what the money is set aside at. And uh, at the time that these things were first created uh, was was a high percentage. And then when the markets took the dump, they were still uh, they were still on the hook for the high percentage. So I remember those were some of the issues, but I didn't re I, I thought it was department by department, not by I, I don't know of any state that enacted it. Do you? You know, I, I'm not aware of any state. Yeah. The headlines are seeing that they're talking city about. county level, right? If city county, it wasn't state. Then, yeah. and by virtue of us being a state, it's hard for them to. I know that uh, LA City's got one, uh, Baltimore's got one, and uh, so there's there's a huge issues with this. So as we move forward, and but things change uh, since 2006. So, yes. anyways, we'll see. Thanks. Okay. And then we have the SECURE Act 2.0, which is a federal law that was just signed into law um, in December of this, of, well, last year now. Um, it contains 90 provisions. Uh, I was going to threaten to go through each of those provisions to see your reaction, but, uh, I, but I don't want to do that. Um, uh, so uh, some of those are mandatory. Uh, many, many are optional for plans to implement. Um, I've been talking to the project manager and the executive sponsor at Department of Retirement Systems. They're in the very early stages. Um, since the law passed, they've they've been talking to their tax council. They've been talking to other states. Um, there remain a lot of questions um, about um, what exactly this law does, how to implement it. And, um, and it does sound like there may even be some requests to make updates to the law to fix um, issues. Um, states are, are finding already. Um, so I, I did identify in the materials the provisions of it that DRS is currently planning. So they've, like I said, they've assigned, it's actually two, one project manager is doing most of the project 
And then they have a project manager who was assigned implementing um, the Roth plan. Um, and so the last uh, bullet I have on this presentation, um, that Roth project manager will be rolling into the, the Roth project since the RS is already working on that separately. Um, so uh, as far as workload with this, um, I believe when I've talked to Steve about it, that the idea would be to work with DRS to do a presentation and educational briefing to the board on the SECURE Act, on the um, parts of it the DRS is working to implement, um, identify the parts that are optional that the board may have an interest in, and just kind of what the thought process is with um, uh, implementing those in a timeline. Um, yeah. I'm at it again. Yeah, no problem. I heard about this uh, last time. <clears throat> Does this, because it confused me yesterday, the the governor came out with uh, long-term care that there's a percentage of wages that goes into yes. paying for long-term care unless you got an exemption. <clears throat> Does that have anything to do with this bill? N no, not that I'm not aware. at all. Not, not yeah, I don't think so. And it was it was it was delayed implementation of the the money that would be collected and now it's been re uh reestablished yes. okay and that starts july 1st yeah so. yeah and that that's separate from this yeah yeah <laughs> okay that's that's what i want to know <laughs> but. okay okay and then uh firefighter definition uh, this was an issue that there was a bill for this uh, legislative session. Um, prior to there being a bill, it was an issue that board staff had worked with DRS on. Uh, we'd worked on, we have uh, monthly meetings with DRS, and often in those meetings we um, try to identify issues that could be resolved in rulemaking at DRS. And, and this was one that was on the agenda that we worked on for um, at least a year and then uh, just hit a, an impasse where um, we, we couldn't reach agreement on, on how to, how to uh, move forward um, changing that rule. And then there was legislation this year uh, seeking to address that. And so the issue here was that there's um, the potential that for firefighters, and in part this is just what a fire department is, um, changing and growing um, with these regional fire authorities and larger fire departments that they're um, could potentially exist positions that are um, in this gray area where they may not be considered uh, left members, uh, where you have firefighters who are um, seeking promotional opportunities, but to move up within the organization, they have to take a position that could be found to not be in left. Um, and that would be because it doesn't meet the current definition um, where uh, they're not supervising other firefighters and they're not actually getting on a fire truck and going out and fighting fires. Um, and so what this bill would have done would, is it would have uh, changed the definition to where if the position was at a left employer, so at a fire department, and it required an experienced firefighter, that it would be in left. And just with the assumption that if a position is going to require that you be an experienced firefighter, um, then they need a firefighter in that position. Um, so, uh, yeah, and so for that so one... So, Mr. Chair, this is Mark Johnson. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Mark. So, uh, notwithstanding the um, the uh, reluctance to make motions in the, this particular May meeting, I do think that this particular issue is critical to what uh, the board is uh, interested in and to safeguard the, the ability of our members to remain in left. I would like to make a motion that uh, we move this issue on to the interim work plan. I second that. Well, in light of no motions, I'm impressed. So, <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we, we do have a motion on the table. We do have a second. Uh, is there any further discussion? Uh, one yeah, of the things I'll, true. go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here. I do think this is really important, and, and I'm okay with moving forward on this. I don't want to get, you know, a bunch of things uh, that we're going to end up working on in the interim and then lose track of what's important, but I do think that this is an important uh, thing that we could we could move forward. 
great. Who is who's speaking at this time? AJ. Is this AJ? AJ okay. Johnson. Got it. Okay. Uh, thank you. As I say, I think this is one of the ones we talked about earlier. This is good, and this is a. Uh, we'll have a further discussion on this in uh, June, and uh, we've already had a uh, discussion this morning on this on how to fix this problem, and I think this is doable. So. Uh, with no further comment, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. No, no uh, motion passes. Uh, Mr. Johnson, could you go to the dictionary and look up, not AJ, but Mark, could you look up the, de uh, the definition of no motions and just get back to me soon? Sure. <laughs> just, just remember that AJ doesn't have a T in his last name. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Good job, buddy. Okay, uh, and then uh, DRS disability determine pro process, determination process. And so this came out of the uh, a bill, the session that was in the Senate that um, was, uh, did a lot of things. One thing it did was create an ombuds position at DRS and this bill did not pass. It got a, a hearing and then did not uh, move out of ways and means, um, but it uh, created an ombuds office at DRS and then it tried to address some additional uh, issues and concerns. Um, one of those was the DRS disability process. And so this one actually also comes out of a letter that the left two board uh, sent to DRS last, I believe it was last interim, um, uh, asking that they consider re-reviewing some existing cases, uh, disability determination cases, and apply um, their current processes to those cases. So there's been changes over the years. Uh, the most significant change, or one of the mo more significant changes, was um, the use of a third party medical review contractor. And so that was part of what the board was requesting uh, DRS to do. Um, uh, they didn't want to do that because it would require them, in part, they didn't want to do it because it required them to reopen cases that had already been litigated um, through the APA process, and they were unwilling to do that. And so this uh, included in this bill um, was language that would have required them uh, to, to do that, to uh, reconsider those cases and apply the current processes. Um, as far as how many cases this would impact, um, there, just a few that I'm aware of, um, uh, but I yeah, don't have an exact number on that, but I know there's been a few in particular that have been an issue. Um, yeah. Okay. So DRS admin fees and uh, UAL charges for members. Uh, so there's uh, some situations where uh, members are charged, when members go to purchase past service credit, they're charged the DRS administrative fee that is typically charged to employers and any unfunded actuarial liability costs that are typically charged just to the employers. Um, but there's some, yes, yeah, some very limited circumstances where um, members are charged those costs. Um, and so this would, if this was also included in that ombuds bill, and if it, uh, it, it would impact all retirement systems, not just uh, left members. Um, and a couple of those uh, specific circumstances are when new employers join the systems and members want to purchase past service credit, and then also with uh, elected officials uh, when they're picking up their past service credit. Okay, and then we have uh, DRS appeal deadlines also coming out of that ombuds bill. Um, this would have increased the number of days to file an appeal and it would have created tolling for the days to file an appeal um, if DRS requests that the member provide additional information to them. Um, so just some background on that, DRS follows the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, that requires, uh, I believe, 20 days to file an appeal. DRS currently has it at 60. The bill would have uh, pushed it out to 90 days. Um, and then the Current APA doesn't have this tolling requirement in there, um, but this would have created a tolling requirement that if the, yeah, when, when the department asks the um, member to provide additional uh, information. And so the concern there came that there was at least one member, if not a couple, that felt that um, they had 
kind of been set up to fail by the department that they had um, been asked or told they could provide additional uh, medical documentation. They went about gathering that information and then found out they had missed the deadline. And so they didn't realize that the deadline was still going. They thought they had uh, more time since they were uh, gathering this information for the department. Right, survivor re-election window. So back to that survivor option, uh, and this was also in the Ombuds Bill. Um, so a few years ago, or yeah, 2020, there it is, um, the bill, the board passed a, or endorsed a bill that was passed that um, created a window to change your survivor option. Um, in the course of the legislative session, um, there was a issue raised uh, that required, um, that required an amendment to the bill that um, said it couldn't be implemented until DRS received IRS approval um, that it was okay to do. And so DRS did eventually receive that IRS approval um, and then implemented it. And so there was this window for people from the time the law passed to DRS receiving uh, that approval from IRS where uh, there was one member that we're aware of and is a PERS member who wanted to change his survivor option but was not able to. And then kind of the catch 22 of it is by the time DRS received the approval, their, the new window had passed. Um, so they couldn't change it. Um, and so this bill would have allowed that person to change it. And then basic salary definition. Um, uh, this one was also in the Ombuds bill. It would have, uh, for holiday pay, uh, holiday pay is typically considered overtime, except in very limited circumstances. And this would have made that consistent to where it's always uh, considered uh, overtime and therefore basic salary. And then for non-duty, there's a similar situation with non-duty disability pay. Um, annual leave and sick leave are uh, typically considered salary except in uh, very limited circumstances uh, involving non-duty disability, um, where employers allow members to turn over insurance payments to the employer in exchange for reinstating their sick leave or annual leave. In those uh, instances, it's not considered basic salary. Um, and so this was seeking to create just consistency there, where in all instances, um, it's considered uh, basic salary for the member. separate bill here for part-time um, law enforcement members. Uh, House Bill 1413, Senate Bill 5424 would have created flexible work for law enforcement officers. So this was a much larger bill outside of um, the pension system, but it did touch on the pension system. It had one section in it that would have changed uh, left membership to allow for part-time law enforcement officers in the left. And so as of now for law enforcement and firefighters, part of the definition is full-time. So it's full-time, fully compensated. Um, and this would have changed that to allow for part-time law enforcement officers. Um, yeah. Okay, so the next steps uh, would be the board could uh, remove or add any topics from the interim work plan. And then, um, like we said at the beginning, in June, the board can vote to adopt the plan. Um, as far as, uh, yeah, Steve, as far as like more detail about, I, I think most of the w items that went over, if the board does choose to go forward with those, they would be, except for the ones I specifically said, would just be kind of a briefing, an educational briefing. The other ones would tip go through our typical process of potentially having three presentations um, to, to study and then make the determination whether to uh, endorse legislation or not. Yeah, we kind of we covered um, yeah 13 topics in 30 minutes, and there weren't a lot of questions or almost any questions. So from our perspective, uh, the staff, we want to make sure that if you have questions about these, that we can be prepared either to answer them today or if we don't know the answers, to answer them in June. Because if you come up with a question in June and we don't know the answer, then it 
can be problematic if you're voting or deciding in June whether you want to move forward with an issue. Um, some of these issues, as Jacob was saying, they might end up just being one briefing, an in informational briefing, and that would uh, take care of it. Others, to the extent that they would end up um, requiring legislation, that might be the three-part um, process that the board typically uses before endorsing legislation. What we want to make sure today is that you have um, an opportunity to discuss and ask about any of these topics. Um, the only, um, you know, Jacob mentioned uh, at the opening of the meeting, one topic that came up some last year and then has been coming up here again recently as the COLA was uh, published, it has to do with inflation. Inflation was more than 3% last year and it's more than 3% this year. The COLA is capped at a maximum of 3%. And so uh, there's been some members kind of wanting to better understand that. Jacob did an informational briefing on that topic last year for the board about how much inflation has been, how the COLA works, how the excess above 3% is banked for the future, um, and what that would look like. The only other smaller topic that came up also related to the, um, the uh, benefit improvement bill was there was a decision made in the original bill that if you, there was that date, February 1. And if you were retired on that date, you got the retiree benefit. If you were active on that date, you got the choice. There was a handful of members then who were retired on February 1st, but then ended up returning to work after February 1st. And DRS has um, determined that for those members, their status on February 1st is determinative um, as opposed to their status at the time they might re-retire. Those members would get the retiree benefit only. And there was a um, question about whether that or not that issue should be um, kind of revisited, whether um, Apply, giving those members when they re-retire the second time that they would get the same choice as any other active employee at retiring at that time. Off the, that's all that we've heard. Then again, not all of these issues were directed to the board in terms of um, some of these have come up in presentations to the stakeholder groups or in individual emails to board staff. But that, as you can see, um, there's 13 plus with the possibility of the other two that we, you know, threw out there. That's a lot of, um, a, a lot of potential issues. Um, most, if not all of those would also end up requiring legislation. So, um, the um, you've already decided one, so I guess we're down. Uh, the list is down from 13 to 12, but uh, um, or 12 or potentially back up to 14. So maybe we're not making as much progress. But some of these um, we could we could start off with an informational briefing, and then you could decide at that time whether you wanted to move forward. You know, so for instance, just um, some of them would be like the benchmarking peer comparison. If you wanted to do that, maybe do it as part of the uh, strategic planning. Um, that, that one is a significant amount of workload, doesn't result in a bill. So it's more like information for you guys to have, but it doesn't really um, necessarily lead anywhere. It might answer questions, but it, it doesn't. Okay, uh, the tier multiplier uh, date, that would be one we could start with an informational briefing and you could 
go on with that, maybe even tie it in with the retiree return to work issue since they both do BIA, and then you could decide whether whether to move forward. The taxation issue, that's going to require probably some work with not only DRS, but with outside tax counsel. DRS's determination on taxation was based on outside tax counsel advice, and so trying to figure out what it was about that advice that triggered the determination and could that even be changed by state statute. So that would probably be a, a one briefing thing to start with uh, just to find out if it's even possible. Uh, and if the answer is no, then it's, it's done. Drop would be um, a significant workload, particularly if there was any expectation that there would be legislation next session. Um, in all likelihood, the, 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 oh, the process maybe for discussing drop would be a briefing. And then if there was a decision, for instance, to just get more current information, you want to refresh the information that's available Given the amount of federal issues, that would probably be um, something that we would ask for a study on so that we could get outside tax money for outside tax counsel. Um, so if there was going to be something on that, it might be like a study bill for next session, and then the bulk of the actual work would be done next interim. Yeah, Representative Bloomquist. Would you need a bill or would that just be even a budget proviso? It could be a budget proviso, yeah, since it's purely just authorization to get that tax council money. Um, we, we use the same outside tax council as DRS. They're going to have all kinds of questions about how to administer something like that. So doing, doing it in that order, getting the tax council advice first would make a lot of sense. 2.0, we get the briefing from DRS and find out if anything needs a bill. No, another question on, on, on the uh, budget proviso. Yeah. Would that just be in your DP then, like an agency request, and then part of your kind of yeah. budget request, and then the, the governor would vet that, um, either included or not? Is that how that would work, or is there a it, different? It could. We've had uh, budget requests that popped up during session before without uh, coming through the agency process, but if you guys wanted to ask for it using the formal process, yep, we've done that as well. Did that with tribes, for instance. Um, the the rest of them, some of the the disability determination process, the admin fees, the appeal deadlines, those were all the survivor reelection, holiday and annual leave payments. Those were all ones that we worked on with DRS, reached the point where they either couldn't be done without legislation or they couldn't be done without resources because some of those have a workload impact and a, a cost impact as well. Um, then the, um, and then the part-time thing, that was sort of, um, it was indirectly related to the board, but that was a, there's this question of particularly for law enforcement officers, how do we deal with the workload um, impacts? There's a lot of mandatory overtime for law enforcement agencies around the state. All employers are trying to figure out ways to help manage that. That was the topic, uh, the policy issue, if you will, behind the sponsors. Uh, moving to a proposal of this issue, and it kind of ties into the same thing for DROP. DROP is a way of keeping members in the workforce as opposed to them retiring. It's a different way of sort of addressing that same workload issue um, or staffing shortage issue, however you want to frame it. But um, we will be prepared to kind of answer or any questions you have about how much work each of these issues would require in June. Kind of like uh, that was a very high level there. Jacob gave the high level and then this was sort of a summary. Um, I 
you, you know, um, uh, I, I don't know how many of those would take bills, but just, you know, I, the board's not, ha, has never recommended 14 bills in the past. And so we'll be looking for your um, direction in June, kind of sorting out which ones uh, you want to maybe take one step further before you say yes or no, um, which ones you're ready to say no on in June or push back to the next year and which ones you're like you've already made one decision today, one that is definitely needs to be done um, uh, this interim. And then we'll have the schedule for you about how that could all play out. The actuarial topics, the administrative topics, most of those are already sort of slotted in. Um, yeah. How much uh, coordination is there? I know there's some overlap on pension policy uh, with the select committee on pension policy. You know, if, is there discussions? Will we know what they're interested in by June or? Any? By June, probably. They're going to, my understanding is they're going to um, talk in May. They're going to start talking about their work plan. The timing of the meetings, we're ahead of them this month, so we weren't, we don't. They were supposed to meet um, yesterday, but canceled. Yeah. So they so, meet until June. So it's unlikely that they'll have decisions made in June on the issues that are out there um, that we know would have crossover with the select committee. Um, some of the DRS issues and DRS is on the select committee, the, the director of DRS. Those would be ones that, uh, you know, for instance, Jacob mentioned the one person that's involved in the reelection was a PERS retiree. Um, holiday pay applies to the state patrol as well as to left two, but it doesn't apply to any of the other plans. Um, I don't know outside of left, I don't think any other plans are situated where the employers bargain for the members to turn over their insurance payments the way they do in left for duty and non-duty. The um, appeals deadlines, that would apply to all the plans. You know, you, uh, Jacob mentioned the, the thing, you, you got 60 days to appeal, um, provide us some additional information. You've got 90 days to provide the additional information and you provide it on day 80 and they're like, well, thank you for the information, but you missed your appeal deadline, so your case is dismissed. That, that kind of mechanical, that, that applies to all the all the plans uh, potentially, and um, the admin fees and the um, UAAL charges that certainly would provide, uh, probably impact more of the plans dealing with PERS-1 and TERS-1 UAALs. For LEF-1, it would, or for LEF-2, it would only um, apply if a LEF-2 member was buying service credit prior to like around the year 2000, because since you, the year 2000, there hasn't been any UAAL, um, or it's been positive anyway in, in left one. But if somebody was buying service credit, say for 1990, yeah, they might actually get billed for a left one unfunded liability charge that uh, doesn't exist anymore, but it did exist in 1990 for so left. Two, that's probably not, a, as a practical matter, not a, a significant issue, but for PERS 2, 3, TERS 2, 3, where the PERS 1 and TERS 1 unfunded liabilities still exist, yeah, that's a... Um, that's 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 Senator Holy has his hand raised. Yeah. Senator Holy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, j just a, a quick thought here. Steve, when you're talking about a drop fund, I remember we first talked about that a long time ago. Uh, but it strikes me as 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 you're you're processing this that in order to have any kind of a a, a, a structural definition of this, uh, this would be one more fund that DRS would potentially administer 
uh, that would have potential impact by the probe's decision. And I know there's no clear policy out there that's been established uh, from the other funds that actually were at issue that brought the probe's decision uh, and, and that, uh, you know, possibly you could add that in just some sort of a cursory manner to how you would define how a drop fund would work if we're going to, to, to explore that at all. Yeah, that gets at your topic. The probe's decision had to do with crediting accounts with interest. And it's still, as my understanding, going through final issues with the Supreme Court and administration. Uh, the DRS is working on the uh, how to administer the final decision. Um, but yeah, how how accounts get credited with interest would definitely be one of the issues that would be, arise associated with a, a drop plan discussion. Yeah, and Senator Holy, I I actually work pretty um, aggressively on the on the drop plans when they first were established. I think the first one came out of Baltimore, and there's a couple other ones. And there's so many different varieties of how it works and how they're set up. That's good. The 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 legwork on that. I mean, if we decide to go down that road, it's there's a whole litany of of plans. And I, as I say, I don't remember if there's any state. Uh, plans. It was mostly departments that had created them within their organizations and got the buyout through IRS and some of the other ones. And it uh, so uh, I was looking at that one. I'm thinking that's that's going to be the big lift if we, if we get involved in that. But that's it's on the list. It's it's out there. And sometimes uh, over time, things become more streamlined or they become more complicated. And so. Uh, that's a good one to have, especially next month. Maybe have uh, to you know to make a determination. So it's it's a uh, it, it's a great idea uh, if you can make it work. But everybody has their idea of how it works. <laughs> so I it's tough. And. I apologize too. So I can't see all of the board members on the screen here. So if um, do do any board members have questions about any of these topics um, that you that for now, Representative Berquist? I did have uh, some people reach out during session uh, around the banking of you know. And so after that three percent, what we're seeing seven percent. Uh, cost of living increase uh, each year. Uh, at what point do we need to change strategies if that is a continuing thing? Um, I've talked to like our staff person, David Pringle, for example, and I uh, got some ideas, you know, if maybe if the bank hits a 10% or higher that uh, you increase that award uh, up to maybe 5% until certain, you know, things are hit. Uh, there, there's definitely options there. It'd be interesting to hear if there's um, ideas around that. But, you know, again, you don't, you don't want it to be something that can run out of control that then um, potentially has impacts on, on the system if you're not careful. Yeah, and all the plan two threes have the same COLA. So that's one of the things when this came up last session as inflation started, you know, over a year ago, um, the select committee was very focused on wanting to deal with the plan one COLA issues first before they kind of got into any plan two pool issues. I don't know how much that has changed. I know there was a, a bill this session for a one-time COLA for PERS 1 and TERS 1 and a direction to the select committee to study it um, and report on it next year. So that, that plan one COLA issue kind of has, um, is also sort of uh, competing, if you will, for attention with the Plan 2 COLA issue. Other other questions from other board members? OK, as Pat mentioned at the beginning, too, and I'll reiterate, um, if you have questions that come up as you think about these issues further or you talk about them with your peers and colleagues, you can reach out to Jacob or to me at any time leading up until June. And then 
just by way of preparation, you'll kind of be going through all of these in June. So the June meeting, um, if you're planning on your own personal calendars and you've gotten used to a board meeting only taking a certain amount of time, I would set that aside for June. I would plan on the meeting lasting at least until noon. And um, uh, we'll have food here and but I don't I don't know unless unless the meeting is scheduled to go through lunch, we're not allowed to provide lunch. But we can provide enough um, morning snacks that if one person wanted to have like four muffins for lunch or something like that, they could they could probably do that. How about four donuts? If we could do that. Um, we'll make sure that there are donuts for the June meeting, and maybe then that'll get more get get members here. But <laughs> all right, there you go. Um, so that that's the plan for June. It'll we'll go through each of them. We'll answer all the questions that you have to the best of our knowledge. We'll get direction from you about next steps, if there are any, on all thirteen of these issues plus. The COLA issue, plus maybe the um, um, the Benefit. return to work issue, and then we'll just go from there. Um, we'll several of these, as you re, you know, they'll involve coordination with DRS. Um, uh, they've been great to work with um, for years. I mean, the coordination with DRS is solid. We meet with them each month. They're very good about letting us know what they can and can't implement. Um, and so to the extent that some of these, you know, the question is, what would it cost to do this? Well, then we'll, you know, go through it and talk about them further and come back to you later on. But those, those specific timing and question issues, we should be able to answer all of those in June. Thank you, Steve. Any further comments on the issues? Seeing none, we can move down to number three, administrative. Um, for the admin um, briefing, there the I did want to mention the um, WACOPs had their spring meeting earlier this month. Uh, Jacob was there and um, he may have been working on the succession planning too, from some what I understand from some of the comments there. He, he mentioned that DRS's uh, implementation of their old systems, you know, they're they're implementing new systems to update the old ones, and that I was around for the implementation of the old ones. I'm not sure if he was drawing a direct correlation there or not, but um, but yeah, Jacob was here to answer questions. We've got the um, firefighters annual convention coming up um, don't know at this point in time that's always uh, to what extent any pension issues come up at that conference but we'll have um, board members there to answer questions we're also planning on having a ombudsman there to answer questions with that talked already about the next meeting. It's June 28th. So uh, plan on it going 930 to noon. I think that concludes my administrative briefing, Mr. Chair. OK, uh, I see nothing else on the agenda. I have to unless you have something else. The one thing we wanted to make a note of has to do with uh, public comment. Huh? OK, that would be my job. All right, you go ahead and take care of that. If that's all we have left, uh, the Left 2 board uh, welcomes public comment in advance of all meetings and has posted instructions on the website for the submission of written comments. Staff received no comments in advance of today's meeting for distribution to the board. So with that, uh, that is uh, our comment. And Representative Burquist? Yeah, we, we kind of bent over just in case you know we talked like Jacob and I talked about 
if we got an email that was directed to us as opposed to directed to you and asked to be disseminated to you, we went ahead and brought it up better to be over inclusive than uh, feel like somebody may their comments may have got left out. But everything everything's been included. So you didn't like my statement? Is that what no, you your statement was wanted? actually perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Burquist. I, mean, I can move to adjourn. Move. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, stay with Steve. <laughs>